Welcome to our next Department of History and Archaeology Research Seminar, and I'm very pleased to introduce our doctoral researcher, Pauline Clark, who will be telling us all about what the Anglo-Saxons were up to in the Welsh marches. Over to you, Pauline. Thank you very much, Howard. Um, let me just share my screen. Can you now see my screen and hear me OK? That's right. Good. OK, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to do this today, I think. Um, a very quick introduction. I've been around at Chester for quite a long time now. I have done consecutively my BA, MA and now I'm uh, in the middle of my PhD here. Um, and I'm looking at the early medieval period, which is kind of also known as the Dark Ages, erroneously. I'm going to try and get in as many um, phrases that Howard hates as I possibly can in this quarter of an hour or so. Um, and when you read around this period, there are kind of three, three main themes that emerge. You get um, what was the continuity after the Romans largely withdrew um, in sort of AD 410-ish. And how difficult it is to see this period in the archaeological record because um, the period was aceramic and also a lot of the buildings um, sort of reverted, if that's the right phrase, to wooden buildings and they're quite difficult to see. And um, the main sort of source of, of, uh, of information comes from cemeteries which tend to dominate in the in the uh, east of the country. And there are reasons for that. Um, there's more development over in that side. The soil conditions are more favourable to cemeteries. And, the, and what happens is that you, you get this um, perception that there's nothing at all um, over on our side in the west. And this is Audrey Meany's Gazetteer of Cemeteries in, that was published in 64. And even, um, even though it's quite old, it still sort of largely forms the basis of, of how people think about distribution of Anglo-Saxon um, culture in the country, in that, you know, it's very heavily weighted to the east coast and nothing happened over here. And it, it, you know, mainly published out in 64, but you still get this a lot now when people are analysing patterns of artefact um, distribution. So these two maps are from different papers that have been published in the 2000s. And as you can see in the one on the, the left, um, you know, the March area is completely excluded and the concentration is very much sort of Nottingham, Northamptonshire eastwards. That's distribution of uh, Winchester style metalwork. And um, the other one is distribution of uh, early cruciform brooches. And again, there is a little a little bit in, the, in our area, but most of it is is over on the far coast. And, it, you know, you have to be wary that most a lot of these maps are trying, trying to make a point about things. But even so, um, it's quite depressing the number of times you read um, about distribution and it says, oh, it doesn't happen in, in the West at all. But this can't really be the case because there was a lot going on here and um, in a, a lot has been documented and is is verified. So uh, the Battle of Maserfeld, which is thought to have been a location by Oswald Street, took place in 641. That was um, the, the Britons against the incoming Anglo-Saxon forces. Um, much of Enloch Abbey in Shropshire was founded by an Anglo-Saxon nun by 680 AD. Office Dyke, of course, was built in the middle of the 8th century. And there are other, you know, other instances that we can quote. And then later on, Chester, Bridge North, um, and there's another location as well, which I can't bring to mind at the moment, were all um, burst by the early 10th century. And th the fact really that Offa's Dyke was built um, in the middle of this period after only a couple of centuries of, of Anglo-Saxon culture and, and occupation, if that's what you want to call it, um, means that the, the formation of the border was a border of some sort was starting to become um, a feature of the time. So st the study area I'm looking at is quite a, a big area. Um, you've got the counties immediately on the side of the modern Welsh border, plus some of the county of Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire is um, a bit of a strange county. There's a lot of attested activity in the Cotswold area and further east. Um, so I'm only looking at the area immediately adjacent to the border, which doesn't have quite as much um, activity there. And it's characterised generally by high ground, um, getting higher as you move further west, and overall a low population. And this low population is a function of 
not much commercial um, archaeology activity because the development isn't as um, intense as it is in some other parts of the country. Portable Antiquity Scheme, uh, you all know about. I see Amanda's here today. She'll be bored stiff by this already. Um, it's it For my purposes, it's a way of recording stray finds that are uncovered by metal detectorists, field walkers, casual um, observers who just pick something up in a field. And it's a, a database that can be accessed by anybody in the country at all and used by anybody. It's recorded 1.5 million objects plus now. Um, Unfortunately, because of the nature of the beast, it is mainly metals and mainly copper alloy, lead, gold and silver, which introduces its own bias. And we know about detectorists and all the problems there are with um, differential reporting, not reporting at all. Um, it's also carried out mainly on cultivated land, um, ploughed land, which, again, we don't have as much of in this part of the country. But... It, you know, overall, it's adding data to an area where maybe we wouldn't have any um, were it not for this. But we still have a problem uh, kind of in awe of people who have thousands of, of artefacts to look at. Because if you look at the records for the early medieval period for the counties in the east of the area, there are vastly more numbers than there are in our area. But, you know, 579 for the for the marches is significant. Um, there's very little reported, uh, you know, from archaeological finds. So this is this is good data, even though it's a little bit sparse. So what I'm trying to do is establish the distribution and the spread of Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian cultures as they came into the as they came into the country and moved through the period of the early Middle Ages. And um, the database helpfully defines early, middle and, uh, early, middle and late periods um, so that we can look at this by in a, in a temporal distribution as well. And the other thing I want to look at is um, productive sites. And I know that Anglo-Saxon and Viking are contentious terms, but to be honest, until somebody comes up with something better, for the cultures that we're looking at, I'm going to stick with them. Um, it, I, you need to say Anglo-Saxon to distinguish it from Irish culture or British. Or, so uh, I don't mean it as a peoples, I mean it as, as a, a, an art style or a culture, really. Typical artefacts that tell us something about um, the people, the items on the um, left-hand side are sleeve clasps, unique to early Anglo-Saxon uh, culture, used for a limited amount of time, found predominantly in graves and not thought to be a feature at all of the east of the country. But actually, if you look at the distribution, there are five sets here. Again, not big numbers, but enough to say that they're not um, completely excluded from this area. The item in the middle is, is again a particular, it's a Norse bell, it's a particular Scandinavian artifact, short-lived, probably associated with Norwegian people, and again, um, although it's found in the Isle of Man and Ireland, until recently it's not been considered to be in this part of the country. And then the item on the right is uh, a, 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 an introduction. The Vikings introduced uh, metal stirrups, and this is a decoration for a metal stirrup. So all of these things can tell us something about the time that, that these ideas were arriving in the marches and um, what was happening to them. And if you look at Norse bells, the map on the right, the black and white map, um, was uh, part of the biggest study done by Sean Felder and Richards in 2011. And they didn't at the time, if you if you look, there are very, there are, there's one Norse bell that might possibly be in our area. And then there's nothing else. All the rest are concentrated here. And as I say, on the Isle of Man and Ireland. But now if you look, and I agree, that the colours on this map aren't good on the screen, but we actually have five or six of these things as you know into wales and around cheshire admittedly they don't penetrate any further south but it's interesting that we've got so many here when they've not been considered to be a feature in this area in the past and this is the type of thing i'm trying to get to the bottom of really and understand what it means and what effect it has on the population in the area so what i found out to date well um i'm still um in a much earlier phase than uh, rihanna and so please forgive me, I'm kind of showing results without a lot of interpretation at the moment on these. But this is um, an early um, map that I've produced that shows 
artifacts by their temporal distribution, so early, middle and late. And again, it, there are a number of features on there that I'm going to look at in some more detail, but you have the expected concentration in the south and probably in the north, because we already know that the Vikings, for example, um, were settled on the Wirral. So it's no surprise to find later items in the north and the south. But in the middle, there's a lot of early items coming very, very far west, much more westerly than we would have expected. And this is um, this is quite a surprise, really, and obviously means that there was more happening earlier than was previously you know, thought. If you think about Langos uh, Cranach, which is in this area here, that was um, ninth century it you know it's after all this early activity so something is happening and it's it's important to, to find out what to understand what really um there are a few features here um shropshire strangely has um less british place names surviving than staffordshire does which is further um east and this is this possibly means that that shropshire was settled from an early date and was subject to Anglo-Saxon rule from an earlier date than's previously been thought. It might be part of the motivation behind Offersdyke and Wattsdyke. Um, it's a shame that we, it's a shame we have hills in this area because that means that we're missing out on, on some opportunities for metal detecting. It would be nice to know how far over this penetrated. But you know even this is, is quite exciting at this point. The other thing that's quite obvious from this is um, how the rivers are very important. The rivers, you know, a lot of the distribution follows some of the major rivers, and it would be interesting to understand that. Um, if we look at uh, Anglo-Saxon and uh, Viking culture, I haven't, there's a few other subgroups as well that I haven't put in on this map. Um, again, Anglo-Saxons very, very um, well represented in Shropshire and down into Herefordshire, and this might be um, the uh, sort of impetus for the kingdom that was thought to have formed here and it, you know again it needs to put it against the, the documentary evidence to see what this means to us but it, it's possible this is why Shropshire has less survival of British place names that actually it was it was um, subject to Anglo-Saxon culture and ideas from quite early on. The other thing I'm having a look at are productive sites and productive sites aren't areas where anything has been produced. They're productive in terms of what they yield for metal detectors. And I think about uh, 15 years ago, Pestel and Umschneider did a huge study of productive sites on the east of the country. And they were, de they were dealing with sites that had hundreds of fines, um, which we're obviously not going to have the benefit of here. But if you look at uh, Cheshire in particular, there's only one productive site in Cheshire. And that has 8% of the fines, total fines for the county. So I've used this 8% figure and carried it through the, the counties. And what you end up is, is with is um, five, six, seven, eight major productive sites and six further minor possible sites. Um, I don't think it's a secret, particularly that the productive site in Cheshire is Huxley, which is where the Huxley Hoard was also found. And although the river that flows through Huxley is navigable at the moment, in the period it was, and it was, would have been an important corridor out into the Irish Sea. So uh, that immediately suggests that Huxley has a connection with the wider Irish Sea diaspora and the trade that was going on through there. And that's something to explore further. Um, there's a couple of productive sites that are, are located very near to Roman roads. Roman roads um, continue to be important um, arteries of communication at the time. So it's interesting to look at what other developments are around those areas that tie in with the Roman roads and what was happening um, that drew people to those areas. There is uh, one probable cemetery. Um, one of the most interesting finds from that area is actually a piece of pottery that is uh, obviously and a cremation urn from the period, and then there are fines associated with it. So was that near to a settlement? Can we identify the settlement? Um, can we identify the political um, allegiances that the, the, the of the people who were buried in the cemetery? Um, there are 
uh, I say five or six sites in Herefordshire because two are very, very close together the within, within a kilometre. But what's really interesting is, although one looks like a, a probable market site um, and could possibly be associated with a major religious house that's not too far away, and that's a feature of some of the market sites because the monks um, sold off their surplus and also produced items for sale to pilgrims. So it's quite, they're quite often associated with the monastic sites. The other site that's adjacent to it, though, has a completely different characteristic and looks like something else was going on there. So it might be that over a period of, of a couple of centuries, this particular site maintained its importance, but its function shifted. So that's going to be really interesting to look at as well. And um, as I say, there's a lot of the sites are associated with the major rivers. There's also a couple of interesting um, pattern distribution patterns that might look like um, ancient routeways. So that's something else I'm looking at. As I say, um, compared to Rihanna, I'm kind of in the very early stages of this. Well, I would like to speed it up a bit. Um, so what I'm looking at is the spread of culture. I'm using basically the information from the PAS database because it's the best, most numerous information that we have, shall we say, for the area. To look at the spread of culture, the temporal diffusion of these ideas into the West and how these relate to significant sites. Uh, but I'm doing it cross border and cross county. Um, the PAS is, is uh, recorded by county and very often because of the way in Wales um, archaeological um, uh, bodies are set up, they tend to look at one particular area. And I'm trying to break out of that a little bit and try and um, look at a, a, at a border area rather than a county or an association like CPAC, for example. So uh, the, the new approach is, is this, this getting out of the silo, as Paul Belford would say, and looking at new evidence as well that might set, signify settlement or trade or political ideas in the area. OK, so that's me. Um, thank you for listening and any questions and comments would be greatly appreciated. Thank you.